so um, basically, uh, last time, well, well, we introduced the overall idea that what we're going to do is we're going to uh, talk about, uh, for the first part of the course, basically flat space gravity, and in particular how we can understand quantum effects in flat space gravity. And um, I said that, uh, well, one of the main uh, avenues of, of, of attack for this will be to actually classify the possible kinds of interactions that a graviton can have, or the possible kinds of uh, uh, constraints that we can derive on a theory of gravitons. And so the first step will be to actually define very carefully what is a graviton. And for this, we looked at the symmetry group that is relevant for this. And the symmetry group that is relevant in four dimensions in flat space is the Poincaré group. And so I'd like to continue with this and formally develop the, the relevant uh, representations. So um, just to, I think probably we already said this last time, but um, what we want is we want basically, uh, we want to see how Poincaré acts on the Hilbert space of our system. And so roughly speaking, there'll be some unitary transformation associated to a Poincaré transformation lambda A, um, which acts on states psi, or as we said, more formally on rays. So psi will go to some U of lambda A psi. And of course, our U, the unitary representation um, associated to a given uh, Poincaré transformation, will satisfy the group law. So we have also the, um, we also have that um, U of lambda two a two uh, composed with U of lambda one a one acting on psi is the same as U of uh, lambda two lambda one, and then lambda 2 a1 plus a2. And then I also introduced, uh, just for completeness, um, the notion that the, the, that the relevant group decomposes into four sectors and that we're really mostly interested in the one that is continuously connected to the identity, which we call the proper orthochronous subgroup. So, um, good. But um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to actually working at the level of these unitaries and of their generators, I'd like to just um, talk about, well, a subject that I think most of you know well and just the Poincaré algebra. So um, let's talk about that for a little bit. So... Uh, Okay. So let's consider uh, a small Lorentz transformation or an inf infinitesimal Lorentz transformation. And let's also consider a small uh, translation. So, in other words, lambda mu nu is delta mu nu plus some matrix omega mu nu whose elements are small and the translation vector a nu is just some small epsilon mu. Okay, so with, in the appropriate sense, omega mu nu okay, is very small and of course also epsilon mu, let's say component by component, all are very small. So now, um, we already wrote down the requirement, just the formal requirement, that lambda itself is a Lorentz transformation. So um, if we say that lambda is a uh, Lorentz transformation, then what we can deduce is that basically omega mu nu with both indices up plus omega nu mu is equal to zero. So we have that these, these generators here are anti-symmetric. Uh, anti-symmetry. And so um, quickly what this allows us to do, let's say in 3 plus 1 
space-time dimensions. So um, we have therefore, um, well, an anti-symmetric matrix. So we have uh, one half times four times four minus one six uh, independent components in omega. And of course, we have uh, just the four components in epsilon mu. So in total, um, we have uh, the 10, um, well, generators of Poincaré. And so now the next goal will be to see how these 10 generators of Poincaré are uh, represented on Hilbert space, so how do they act? So, um, while this notation, um, we will let them act. Okay, so they act, let's say, um, as a set of J mu nu, which are also anti-symmetric, um, and a set of P mu, which are, well, the uh, the, the, the rep they represent the parameters in epsilon um, on the Hilbert space. And, uh, well, I've already anticipated this result, which I'm sure you all remember, that we think of P as um, being physically related to the momentum, and J will be sort of angular momenta, so it'll be boosts and angular momenta. But let's develop that somewhat formally. So, okay, well, actually, I can still write it. Um, let's say on H as, oops, that's what, that was ugly. Um, so this is like uh, um, something like angular momenta and boosts. And this guy, of course, is just ordinary momentum. Okay, so... Um, Next, let's implement this infinitesimal transformation acting on H. So let's look at uh, um, a unitary representation Let's look at a unitary acting on H, which corresponds to a small transformation. So um, allow me to just write it. 1 plus omega epsilon. And so we will write this u of 1 plus omega epsilon as, well, it's going to be 1 plus, and then here, this is formally the definition of the j's, and minus i, um, how do you want the indices, epsilon p. Okay, so plus, of course, higher order terms, but at the uh, linear terms in the generators, this is what we have. Okay, and then, um, well, first things first, the fact that this guy is a unitary, okay, so unitarity of U obviously implies, as usual, that the generators themselves, J, are self-adjoined, and the same, of course, for the p's, which if we knew nothing, we would say, well, if we knew nothing about uh, quantum field theory, just from quantum mechanics, you would say that that means that those things are observables, they're Hermitian operators acting on Hilbert space. Can we put two different signs with the reason? That's just the convention. Um, so, uh, and let me just make sure, yes, it is the convention I want to choose. And so now what we would like to do is we would like to find these, the properties, further properties of these Hermitian operators, J and P. So, uh, the way that we're going to do it is actually just use, uh, I'll, I'll raise the board again in a second, but we'll just use the, 
the group composition law and apply it to the infinitesimal form. So, um, what we have is that uh, u itself, so u itself is an operator acting on the Hilbert space. So, how does it transform? Well, it transforms by conjugation. So if I apply, so if I look at my u infinitesimal, and I apply a Lorentz transformation, okay? So I apply a Lorentz transformation lambda a. This, these are two different ones, okay? This is important. This is, this is the infinitesimal that we looked at, and this is some general Lorentz transformation uh, characterized by the pair lambda a, sorry, a Poincaré, Poincaré transformation um, characterized by this pair lambda a, then of course what happens is that the operator itself transforms by conjugation with the unitary operator implementing this transformation. So we have u lambda a, u1 plus omega epsilon, uh, u inverse lambda a. Okay, and let's make a note of this equation because we want to use it again. So then, um, according to the group law, okay, we can rewrite, of course, now what's the argument. We can write this as a, um, we can write this as a uh, one particular expression. So this, uh, this guy is equal to u of a whole bunch of things. So it'll be one plus lambda omega lambda inverse and then we have um, lambda acting on epsilon minus lambda omega lambda inverse a and that's an elementary calculation which of course uh, I encourage you to do but it's basically just applying the group law twice okay well actually um, I suppose you also apply the group law in the first place to write a simpler expression for the inverse but, uh, um, well, uh, maybe I'll write down that one. So you have, of course, we have that um, u inverse of lambda a is equal to u of lambda inverse, and then you have minus lambda inverse acting on a. And the proof is, of course, just by acting this on u of lambda a, you get the, 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 the unit transformation in the Lorentz slot and you get nothing, no translation in the second slot. Okay, so um, that's good. And so now um, what we'd like to do is we'd like to transform this into an equation that's useful for us. So, um, well... What is the useful equation? Okay, I can use right. get a useful equation. Oops, useful equation out of this. Well, the point is that we'll write down um, explicitly this expression, and then we will interpret these these u's as acting on the generators that define u. Okay, so we'll have expressions like u of lambda a j u inverse of lambda a and u of lambda a p u inverse of lambda a and we write out explicitly what we get here and then we just equate coefficients of omega and epsilon and we'll find something useful. So, um, so as I said we write u of lambda a uh, into one plus uh, i half omega mu nu j mu nu minus i epsilon mu p mu u inverse lambda a. But that has to be the same as this expression. And again, a bit of multiplying out shows you that what you get is uh, 1 plus i over 2 
lambda omega lambda inverse mu nu into j mu nu. Okay, I'm just multiplying these out as matrices, obviously. Okay, and I choose the indices then to be down mu nu. Um, minus i lambda mu nu epsilon nu p mu plus there's a third term i lambda omega lambda inverse mu uh, sorry there's an a in here so this acts on a and then it is a vector mu which can contract p mu um, and of course in comparing things you know you can freely freely allow yourself to relabel indices but also to move up and down contractions as you as you see fit so um, and now um, now simply equate coefficients of omega let's say with index uh, rho sigma um, rho sigma uh, and p with index we can say rho right so we look at no, omega rho sigma j rho sigma and we pick out the omega rho sigma j rho sigma term in this expression as well okay so let's let's do it but first uh, I'm gonna clean the boards okay but maybe just to reiterate what I said before what we're going to get of course is we're going to get expressions of the form u j u inverse equals and so that will tell us exactly the finite Lorentz transformation in fact the finite Poincaré transformation as it acts on the generator j and the same will be true for p okay so good uh, are there any questions actually while I clean the board Would you like me to keep one of them, the last one, or is it okay if I just erase them all? Yeah, not the one that I'm already erasing, I hope. Okay, excellent. So, well, I mean, uh, I think this is the kind of uh, this is the kind of thing where you say that the calculation is left as an exercise to the reader. It's, it's really quite simple. But what we get is basically um, we get that u. Okay, let me be totally specific here, j rho sigma u inverse, um, so the finite Lorentz transformation with the arbit finite Poincaré transformation, excuse me, with the finite parameters lambda and a acting on the generators of an infinitesimal Lorentz transformation um, gives me, well it gives me uh, lambda mu rho, lambda nu sigma, okay, into j mu nu but that's not all it's a mu p nu plus a, uh, a nu p p 
something new. Let me make sure I got the indices. Yep. And then u uh, lambda a acting on p mu u inverse lambda a is just equal to lambda uh, nu mu um, p mu. Let me just do one quick check uh, because of indices and so on. Um, yes, that looks good. So um, the, the thing that we recognize immediately is that uh, p mu apparently is just a vector itself under, under this transformation because I can, um, the way that, so p mu as a, Hermitian operator that acts on Hilbert space, if it's acted on by the unitary U that implements our Poincaré transformation, I can uh, rewrite this by treating mu literally as a vector index because we know that the vector um, just transforms with one factor of the matrix lambda. So that's almost true for J. That's the thing that's a little bit more subtle. If I didn't have these two terms, that would be literally true because it's a two tensor. I have two indices or I have two versions of lambda. But um, it's not quite the case. What we have is we have some inhomogeneous bit which corresponds to the translation part. Okay, so, um, yeah. No, the, the omegas are just parameters in this, so they're not operators. Yes, but I could keep the operators same and change the parameters as you transform them by the action of lambda in the second equation. Sure, sure. That would some sort of, as you say, that would be some sort of active and passive uh, point of view. So, so okay, so Jamie and you is something like an inhomogeneous two tensor and p mu is a vector. And now, um, well that's nice because we have the finite form of the transformations it was pretty easy to get, but we get as a bonus in fact we can now uh, re-derive the Poincaré algebra, which we could have gotten in many other ways. But one way of doing it is, well, um, what can you do? You can, you can say, okay, now let's, let's, let's look at the specific case where this itself is an infinitesimal transformation. So then this will be parameterized by J's and P's. And we will find how the J's and P's act on the J's and P's themselves. And uh, a calculation, okay, which really I, I do encourage you, so exercise. So let's, okay, let's consider uh, the case where u of lambda a is itself infinitesimal, okay? A calculation. And I think I, I have put this on the exercise sheet. Um, then gives the following. Well, let's just say, you know, no secret, gives the Poincaré algebra. Namely, um, let me just write it, okay, so we have it in the notes. Um, so you have a commutator of j mu nu with j rho sigma, um, which gives you eta nu rho p, uh, excuse me, j mu sigma, and then a whole bunch of permutations, uh, notably mu rho nu sigma, sigma mu rho nu, and positive last one, uh, sigma nu uh, j rho mu, okay? 
So it would be useful to have this written down because we'll refer to it uh, quite frequently from now on. So I um, p mu j rho sigma eta mu rho p sigma oops, I'm going to run into eta mu rho p sigma uh, what? eta mu sigma p rho, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, and finally, um, p mu p rho is equal to zero. So let's put a box. Let's underline Poincaré algebra. And we will actually use this now frequently when we develop our representations. Um, and we will discover various subalgebras. Uh, and so on that will be relevant for various physical cases. Yeah, don't worry, I don't, I don't have this thing. Okay, so. Good, um, moving on. So, well, let's just uh, put a little bit of meat on what those things mean. Okay, so. Um, in particular, um, physically, well, we start by identifying the zero component of the four vector P mu as the Hamiltonian. Well, I'm just saying it now. Of course, it's also something that I believe all of you are familiar with. But the way to really do this is, for example, we will show um, that the translation subgroup acts in a particular way. And the generators of translation in the time direction will turn out to be P0. And the generators of translation in the space direction will turn out to be the spatial components of P. And so, of course, the generator of time translation is the Hamiltonian. Um, but we also have, as I already said, P. So the three spatial components of this vector is actually momentum. It's the moment, it's, yeah, moment, yeah, let's just say momentum. It's a momentum three vector. And uh, we can define a, a second vector j, well, a pseudo vector actually to be precise, which is j2, 3, j3, 1, and j1, 2, which is angular momentum. And now that last uh, relation there comes in handy, the commutation relation of the Hamiltonian, because we actually have that the Hamiltonian and the angular momentum commute. And the same is true about the Hamiltonian and the linear momentum. So these are, OK, so we can just say that these are conserved quantities according to our algebra. And uh, however, OK, there is a fourth vector of generators that, that we have. So actually, allow me to write it here. Actually, is that, is that visible? Yeah, I think it's OK. So K, which is the, so here we basically have the spatial components. We have the spatial components with two indices, but we also have spatiotemporal components. So we have uh, J10, J20, and J30, OK? And these are the boosts. However, of course, we have from our algebra, one can, one can check that this is not 0. So, uh, the boosts, OK, I wrote that the boosts are not conserved quantities. OK, good. So now we've um, written down the algebra that we're interested in. And furthermore, uh, we've made some physical identifications 
um, what these commutation relations could possibly mean. So um, let me now go really to the business of um, classifying unitary irreducible representations of uh, this structure. Okay. So um, let's move towards uh, the classification and construction, actually, of unitary irreps of Poincaré. And let me remind you, of course, that uh, we already said in our first lecture the philosophy is the one which was pioneered by people like notably Wigner, namely that all of the unitary irreps, well, modulus some subtleties, which we will see, correspond to, you know, one might say elementary particles, but maybe I prefer just physical excitations. And we will be particularly interested in the one that corresponds to the graviton, but actually for technical reasons, even the photon will be very interesting for us. But to even define what we mean by that, okay, that's what we move on to next. So we start, let's start by um, finding the Casimir operators. Well, no, Please look for them. Okay. Um, excellent. Well, why do we look for them? Of course, that because they will be useful to label states uh, that will form a given era. Okay. Okay, so um, so first of all, well, let me anticipate the result. So let me define some um, useful thing called the Pauli Lubansky vector. Okay, that's just some name. Um, and the Pauli Lubansky vector W mu, um, well, is defined to be one half the epsilon mu rho sigma, okay, the invariant epsilon tensor in three plus one, J 
rho sigma p nu. So some combination of these generators. But, um, well, you can show that it satisfies. Um, oops. So this is definitely uh, on the uh, problem sheet. By the way, I think that next week, Wednesday, we should have a problem class. I think it'd be useful. So I'll put the problem set on the Moodle page of this course, um, probably tomorrow. And then next week, we'll have a problem class. But so it satisfies uh, w mu p lambda is equal to 0. But it has some interesting transformation under j. Okay, um, eta mu rho w sigma minus um, eta mu sigma w rho. Um, I erased now uh, the relevant part of the uh, of the uh, Poincaré algebra, but. Uh, of course, what does this mean, actually? What, what, do, what do these commutation relations tell us? That w mu itself is, in fact, a vector under Poincaré also. Yeah. Um, but um, now, have, now, having defined this Pauli-Lubansky, okay, the more important bit um, for the discussion is that um, we have, so, Problem set one. We simply have that C1, which is the square of P, the invariant square of P, um, and C2, which is the invariant square of the second vector W mu, are our two Casimir operators. And so therefore, um, <coughs> we will certainly label representations um, by um, p squared, w squared. And let me reserve some space for possible other labels, where p squared, um, well, such that, OK. Uh, the first C1 acting on P squared, W squared, and Y gives me the P squared eigenvalue. Well, I'm being, trying to be you know, overly clear about what's little p, the eigenvalue, and what's big P, the operator. Okay? But, so this pulls out the P squared eigenvalue. And um, obviously, the C2 pulls out the W squared eigenvalue. Uh, y. And why is some potential um, why is some potential other label? There could be some other label. Okay, and the whole game consists now in um, understanding um, the various different structures that you can have according to a p squared, w squared, and y. And I suppose it won't really surprise you very much, um, either because you already know it or because you have some you know, intuition about the Poincaré group, that of course the invariant square, so whether things are time-like, null, or space-like, of these invariant inner products um, will be ver very important. So, um, but what I propose to do first is actually um, let us just look at how the translation subgroup works. This is extremely simple, um, but it's also useful. Okay, so the question is, so the general question is how do the unitary uh, irreducible representations, the allowable unitary uh, irreducible representations of Poincaré act on these states, and what do we do about these labels in particular given 
um, air apps. But to, do, uh, to, to get there, let me first just deal with the case of translations. This is the simplest case, which we can quickly do before the break. Sorry, I really have the sun in my eyes now. Okay. So let's look at the translation subgroup. So pure translation, of course, uh, is a unitary where we do nothing in the Lorentz bit and we just have A in the translation bit. And this is useful because what we have, well, it's not useful, it's simple because what we have is that U um, A2 U A1 is just the addition of these two, okay? Which means that what we can write, we can actually write any finite translation. So we can write U1A by chopping up, if you want, the vector A, or chopping up the interval by which we translate into n small bits. So this is certainly U of 1, a divided by n, n times, so to the power n, n factors. Um, and thus, in the limit, we can just write, well, we can write that u of 1 and a is the limit of this guy as n goes to infinity um, of u 1 a over n to the power n. So that will give us formally the limit of n um, of uh, 1 minus i a over n a mu p mu to the power m. Okay. I don't know, but now you also know why we chose minus here, because um, Euler explained to us that this is actually nothing but the ex exponential of minus a mu p mu. So in other words, of course, we just get um, the well-known translation operator. Okay, so now this is not uh, particularly great, but um, let me just write. So therefore we know, okay, we know um, P mu just pulls out the momentum. Okay, so therefore we have that U of 1 A acting on a state. This will just be E to the minus I A dot P acting on P squared w squared y. So in other words, the action of u on one of these states is just to pull out a pure phase. So um, just notation a dot p is the contraction over the Lorentz indices a mu p mu. And so we just get a phase. Um, and that's it. OK, so. Um, well, let's take the break now, and uh, after the break, we'll get into really um, the crucial bit of this whole development, which is we, we look at the Wigner's method of induced representations, which will help us to classify all possible um, unitary irreps of Poincaré. All right, so we've done... Um, something about the translation subgroup, and we already know how it acts on our states. And um, so now, uh, just as a well, one further small thing we can do, OK, we can play a similar game for pure rotations. Uh, pure rotations, of course, are part of these J generators. Pure rotations. So, um, 
when if we have some rotation r theta, which is basically characterized by, um, well, theta is a vector, so let's say theta is equal to the angle itself times the unit vector that characterizes the axis um, around which we perform the rotation, theta times n. Well, um, we have that u of r theta and no translation is just 1 plus i omega 2 times the spatial part of these generators, okay, where omega ij is basically the Levi Civita symbol um, contracted, well, um, the so you can use the Levita Civita, Levi Civita to uh, to um, transform a vector, a three vector, into a, a three dimensional anti symmetric two tensor, um, and so we can write this as one plus i theta dot j, either because of well, j, I will say in a second what j is, but either by using this Levi Civita story that I have, or simply by you know writing out uh, the vector j as j12, j23, j, j31, and then taking the, c the corresponding components, independent components of this uh, anti-symmetric object and calling them the components of theta. But um, however you choose to do it, um, you can partitioning, partition it okay, into n small rotations uh, about um, the axis. Okay, sorry about the two entirely different usages of the letter n, but this is just the axis and this is you do it n times. Okay, and then we find that u of theta and zero is equal to um, the exponential of minus i theta dot j. Okay, that's just a little afterthought. All right, so now let's get to really the meat of, uh, well, basically today. So let's talk about a little bit of uh, methodology. Let's talk about what is called Wigner's method of induced representations, because this is our preferred method to talk about the unitary irreps of Poincaré here. The unitary was 1 plus i theta dot j, if it is exponential. Oh, and um, plus i, yeah. Thank you. Okay, and so the origin of this name, of course, is that, well, obviously Wigner invented it, but uh, the point of the induced representation is that we look at the representation of a subgroup of the actual group that we're interested in, and from that representation, we are able to induce one for the full group. So, um, first of all, Let's label our states as um, p mu, um, p squared, w squared, sigma. So not much has happened. It's just that I use explicitly the momentum p mu, the vector, as a label for the state. And I've um, already switched to calling the remaining label sigma because we will see that this is actually related to spin degrees of freedom. So that's, you know, um, customary to talk about in terms of sigma. And so what's this p mu thing? Well, so p mu is not one of the Casimirs, but of course it is a conserved, um, uh, the momentum is a conserved quantity. So, so momentum p mu is a conserved quantity. albeit not one that's invariant 
an der Poincaré. Well, actually, the way that it transforms on the Poincaré will be um, extremely convenient for us to understand what's going on. So now, what is the main idea here of this in method of induced representations? Of course, this is a general method. Um, we only talk about it in the context of the Poincaré group. Um, but um, so the main idea basically here It's that we can use uh, Lorentz transformations. <coughs> so um, we can um, find a reference momentum. So I'll write down in a second the actual definition of this. But the idea is actually most easily uh, explained if we talk about something that, OK, um, will come out of the story, but we know that it exists, a massive particle. So what can you do for a massive particle? Well, you can apply a boost such that the massive particle is at rest, and then you can actually do all of your analysis in the rest frame, and once you've done that, you can boost back into an arbitrary frame. That's the idea. And so if you're in the rest frame, then the momentum of a massive particle, of course, is aligned purely in the time direction. And so a momentum that's purely aligned in the time direction is what we would call the reference momentum for a massive particle. Now, we want to do this more, gen more generally, and we cannot generally talk about the rest frame, but the idea is completely analogous to what I just said. Okay? So, um, for, therefore, a fixed value, so what more precisely then, for fixed value of p squared, okay, so be it negative for, um, well, in our a choice of signature for a massive particle, null, zero for a massless particle, or positive for more exotic objects, tachyonic particles, okay, for a fixed p squared, and a fixed sine of the zero component, okay, um, so you can basically write the equation that your p mu, the momentum that you have, is equal to a judiciously chosen Lorentz transformation, lambda mu nu k nu, okay, for um, judiciously chosen new reference momentum. And actually for uh, each class that we're interested in, okay, this will not be unique, but there exist certain canonical choices that we will make. Okay. But you will see actually um, exactly what I mean. Okay. And so um, notice okay, where lamb where L mu nu Chosen reference momentum k mu and Lorentz transformation L mu nu that I mean exp I mean really explicitly depends on p and on k, but we will not always write this. So um, notice also that I say Lorentz transformation simply because the translations are absolutely irrelevant to this discussion here. Okay, so then now the point is, um, having done this, um, we define a state so the lingo is usually one call them one calls them one particle states because in Perturbative quantum field theory, that's exactly what they correspond to physically. So define a, a one particle state, excuse me, um, at momentum 
phi as well. Uh, we have our state. We already said how we're going to label it. So let me just be completely explicit. So p mu, the two Casimir operators, and the spin label sigma. Um, it's going to be equal to, well, there's going to be a normalization, which we will also choose in a canonical way, but nothing forces us. We could actually just write 1 here, um, times u of lamb of l. Well, let me just write l. OK, this Lorentz, trans uh, this Lorentz transformation here. OK, acting on k mu c1 c2 sigma. So this actually has, well, there's a lot of things in here. But um, I want to insist on two particular aspects. So first of all, I say we define a one-particle state to be this, because this actually defines what we mean by, well, what will turn out to be spin in a general frame. Because notice that we do not have um, any action on the spin here. This, the spin label is the same on both sides. And this just turns out to be the most useful definition of one particle state. Um, secondly, uh, we need to classify and construct all the possible k c1, c2 sigma before this becomes really meaningful, which is precisely what we're going to do next. Okay? So we define the general guy that we actually use in terms of somebody, um, some object that we will find out to be more easy to construct, which is this guy. Nevertheless, we still have to actually construct these guys. OK, so uh, excellent. But before we do that, um, let's act with a general Lorentz transformation on the general state and see what that gives us. OK. So um, or well, yes, um, did I say yeah, let's let's just do a general Lorentz transformation. So um, So u of lambda, OK, allow me to use this kind of shorthand notation. Of course, it's, uh, you know, I, would, I could always write that the translation generator is 0, but OK. So that's going to be equal to um, what? n, our normalization, times, um, well, I act with u of lambda onto u of l. So what I get, of course, is I get u of lambda l, OK, acting on k mu c1 c2 sigma. So I've already used the group property in order to simplify this product. Um, and now uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to do a slightly strange rewriting of this. I'm going to write n of p, and then I'm going to write u of, um, well, what I call l of lambda p, okay, into, and now a second element which basically undoes this, undoes this, excuse me, <laughs> l inverse of lambda, um, l, l inverse of lambda p, lambda l of p, um, and, uh, k mu c1 c2 sigma. I just had this weird thing. I wanted to swipe this to the left because you can on an iPad, where nowadays usually right, but you can on the blackboard. Sorry, so this acts on, acts on this. So what, what have I done? Well, first of all, um, you, L of p, right, is this guy. So we could write, OK, just in shorthand, we could write p is equal to L of p k. Okay. Um, yeah, let me just let me just write the argument p because it just gets too much otherwise. Okay, so p is l of p k. 
So lambda p, the Lorentz transformed p, is equal to L of lambda p acting on k. That's this object. Now, um, I encourage you to just multiply out these two using the group, trans group property, and you will just find this guy. So I haven't done anything. I've just rewritten something. And I've rewritten it because um, Eugene Wigner did at some point. And so um, what's the point? Point is that if we look at this object here, um, we call this guy W. W is actually an interesting object. W is the inverse transformation L inverse of lambda p, lambda L of p, okay? And this has the property. It has the very useful property um, that W acting on K just gives me K. So it's easy to see, okay? L of P acting on K gives me P by definition. Lambda acting on P gives me lambda P. So the inverse of L inverse, inverse of L of lambda P acting on lambda P just gives me K. So I start with K, I finish with K. So this has the property of leaving the reference momentum invariant. Let me just write that. So it is an element of the stabilizer subgroup of the reference momentum. It's a, a particular Lorentz transformation which, um, when it acts on the reference momentum, doesn't do anything. So, all right, uh, let me erase the boards. I think I'll leave that one. All right, so um, leaves the reference momentum invariant. So actually, um, so you should check the following statement. You should check that, um, well, that the set of all elements W in SO 1 comma 3 and actually we can I mean we can just for our purposes restrict to the proper orthochronous part of it plus up arrow 
Okay. Um, uh, satisfying star star um, forms a group and it's called the little group uh, I often will denote it as L G of K so L G associated to a given reference momentum K is of course all W in S O 1 comma 3 plus up such that W of K is equal to K okay and this will be um, very important for us. So, okay, let me put, uh, put some box around it. So this is, if you, well, I've already said it's a stabilizer group of some particular given reference momentum for an, uh, um, a class of momenta, if you want an orbit of momenta with fixed sine of p squared and a fixed value of p squared, let's say, and fixed sine of p0. Now, what's the use of this? Well, um, let's, carry, let's carry on with our task of inducing reps from the little group. I mean, the name is already suggestive that this, this is a simpler object, it's a smaller object, and it will be easier to understand the possible allowed little groups and its uh, representations. And once we do this, we can induce representations of the full Poincaré group, the full Lorentz group, depending on what we look at, um, uh, using our knowledge. Okay. So now let's let's consider again the action of a general Lorentz transformation on a general state. So let's consider. Let's consider u of lambda on p mu. Um, well, okay. I might at some point um, in these manip manipulations not write the c1, c2. Because what we want to do is we want to act with the momentum operator on this p mu. Of course, good old trick, uh, we can write this as u u inverse, uh, sorry, what do I want to do? No, u inverse u, uh, sorry, sorry. I want to have the action of u inverse pu, okay? So I do want to write u times u inverse p mu u acting on, okay, I'm already, I've already run out of patience to write c1, c2. Okay, so, um, and, all of the u's will be u of lambda in this current equation. So I've done nothing. I've just inserted 1 in the form of u, u inverse. But I've already indicated that I want to think of this as being precisely the action on the generator p that we developed earlier. You know what this gives, OK? So this just gives, um, this gives uh, lambda inverse um, say rho mu acting on p rho. Why lambda inverse? Well, because we talked about u p u inverse. So I'm just taking the inverse. Okay. Um, but since p rho now acts on p, okay, I can just make this the momentum eigenvalue. Why not? Okay. So I can write this as lambda inverse rho mu p rho acting on u of lambda p mu sigma. Okay? And then, because I like uh, manipulating Lorentz indices, I can write this as lambda mu rho p rho uh, mu of lambda p mu sigma. And again, I remind you that this actually, that we can write the inverse by switching the indices like this we derived last time. 
So what, what does this tell us? Um, uh, sorry, the eigenvalue still. But what does it tell us? Well, it tells us it's this usual thing, right, one likes to do. It says that the momentum eigenvalue of u of lambda acting on p is lambda p. Not very surprising, but useful. The momentum eigenvalue of the Lorentz transformed state is the Lorentz transformed momentum. But what does it mean? So may maybe I'll write it just as a, write it out, okay, so uh, momentum eigenvalue of u of lambda, so this thing acting on Hilbert space, okay, this is a new state on Hilbert space, is lambda p, i.e. Lorentz transformed momentum. So, good, physically that's actually encouraging, but it also means that, it means that u of lambda p mu sigma, well, it has to be a linear combination of states with momentum lambda p. So what linear combination can I take? Well, I only have this spin label. So it is equal to lambda p nu sigma primed. And all we can do is we can sum over sigma primed over the spin label. So that's all that it can do. Okay. So, okay, yeah, that's, that's really all there is to say. But now what we will do is we will look at, um, we will look at what happens in the uh, reference frame, the frame where the momentum is lambda, where the momentum is k. Then, of course, uh, if we look at the particular case where a little group elements element acts on it, the momentum will not change, right? Here both the momentum is changed and the spin index, is, spin index is reshuffled. In the reference frame, we will be able to write something where only the spin index is reshuffled because we act with something where the momentum is stabilized. That will give us another set of coefficients. And then we relate those sets of coefficients and that will allow us to relate the full representations. And then we were in a, in a position where we can write the full C sigma prime sigma, which is sort of what characterizes a given Lorentz transformation as it acts on states in Hilbert space, in terms of the simpler object, which is defined only with respect to the reference momentum. And then we classify all those objects, and then we're basically done. Okay? So, um, so, um, so let's consider now, or next, okay? So this is the next logical step. Next, uh, consider action of some u of w, okay? W, of course, is a little group element on um, something like k mu sigma. Okay, again, I'm not writing the, the Casimirs. Well, clearly we have the equation u of w as it acts on k mu and sigma. Well, now, by the same logic, we don't need to do any analysis because w leaves k invariant. So all that can happen is that we shuffle the little group index, uh, sorry, the spin index, sigma prime. And I think we call those matrices historically d sigma prime sigma. Okay, all uh, can, can only shuffle spin index.
logically. But now we go back to the relation we had in the first place when we first uh, introduced the concept of the little group, which in fact associates a Lorentz transformation lambda in the little group element W. So we can go back to, um, well, we can go back to the, well, we can go back to literally this equation. So let me, just, just so you guys are, um, well, in your notes. So let's call this equation here, okay, let's call it dagger. Okay. So we rewrite dagger. Um, well, we have um, u of lambda, which acts on p mu sigma. We have this pesky normalization factor. We have u of L of lambda p. Maybe we can use different brackets. And then we have u of our little group element, k mu sigma, where the little group element is like is literally defined in, in this equation dagger. Okay. But of course that just gives me, well, nothing happens to the normalization factor. I do nothing to u of L of lambda p. But this guy we now know by definition just gives me d sigma sig sigma prime sigma k mu sigma primed sum over sigma primed. Okay. But now, um, looking back, okay, we can of course act with u of L of lambda p on k because these are just numbers. Okay, this guy goes straight through. And that gives me the C matrix. So we can write this as, um, well, there's some normalization story here. But it gives me Great. So what we really have done is um, we have now written, so we can deduce, okay, we can deduce that this matrix C of sigma prime sigma um, is actually given by N of P over N of lambda P times the D matrix sigma prime sigma. Uh, yeah, like that. Okay, I, I'm sort of a little bit more explicit about labeling in these type notes, but I think on the board it'll just confuse the hell out of everybody, including me. So um, this is the best way of writing it. Okay, um, and so what we have done is we have basically uh, succeeded in writing the bunch of coefficients which classifies a general Lorentz transformation in terms of the bunch of coefficients which uh, classifies how things are shuffled around in the reference frame. And that's precisely the mathematical expression of what I said earlier, which, which is that let's consider the massive particle. I can go to the massive particle's rest frame and I can look at only you know, what happens in the rest frame, which is much simpler, and then I can talk about the general transformation simply by using a relation like this. Okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Nice yeah. So. Um, what, is the, um, what is the really peculiar characteristic of the Lorentz group which allows you to do this? I think nothing. It's possible to do. You, you can do this on whatever groups. No. Uh, you you can do it on uh, you can do it on continuous groups. Yeah. Sure. It only requires to be continuous. Isn't there a relation between the, the total group and the subgroups you are considering to induce the representation in order to guarantee um, I don't think so. I mean, uh, of course, you probably want to have uh, uh, cases where there are interesting non-trivial representations of such stabilizer groups. 
I mean, if all the rep representations of the stabilizer groups of your um, you know, reference elements are trivial, then you're not going to get anything interesting out of it. So to, um, to finish this um, here, um, we make the choice we make the choice that n of p is actually equal to, well, so that's why it would have been more um, appropriate to keep also the k around because it implicitly depends on k. But we make the choice that n of p is equal to the square root of k0 over p0. Okay? And the reason for this is that, well, it is actually the choice that is made, for example, in uh, the, the field theory textbooks of Weinberg. But why does he make this choice? Well, it's just a particularly convenient normalization of the inner product of states. Okay? So if you have like the inner product of um, a general state momentum p sigma with some p prime sigma primed, then this is a convenient Lorentz covariant normalization. Okay? I don't know if you remember this from your introductory courses on quantum field theory, but there are some books that take some of this normalization into the integration measure if you define the field, for example, as a mode expansion. And there are some which take the integration measure to be completely flat, but, absor but, but, uh, but absorb this uh, normalization into the inner product of states. And this is that normalization, and we'll just take it here. You will see in later expressions, we actually will talk about mode expansions and so on, why this gives, uh, it's actually convenient. Uh, it's, it's a convenient a normalization, but as I said, we could also have just chosen n of p is equal to 1, then we would have had to think a little bit more about the measure, um, integration measure, later on. Okay, but let's just choose it. Okay, so um, I guess we have another five minutes, so what am I going to do? Um, yes, I'm going to do the same as I did last time. Um, first of all, I'm going to write the upshot, and then I'm going to give you an intuitive table of what's going to happen and next time we're going to derive that table. Okay, so I suppose I only need one board for this. Okay, so the upshot really is the following. Oops. So the classification of um, unitary Arabs of Lorentz and then also Poincaré, okay, physically is the same as the classification of um, all possible one particle states. Okay, for now you have to just believe me, but that's like, you know, uh, for example, um, there will be a, uh, a unitary irrep that corresponds to a spin one half vial fermion, and there will be one that corresponds to a massless spin one a photon, and so on and so forth. 
um, and the set of all possible um, such unitary irreps modulo some subtlety is the set of all possible uh, one particle states that you can find in nature and um, the that itself will be the same as the classification of uh, unitary irreps of the possible little groups. Okay. Well, you know, by the way, I have said this now, I think, three times up to some important subtlety. I will precisely explain what I mean by this. It's just that there do actually exist unitary irreps that, to the best of our knowledge, are not realized in nature, but who are we to say that they never will be found? Okay. But so at this point, there is actually a class, there's an important class of unitary irreps, the so-called continuous spin representations, which we don't actually believe are physical. But they do come out of this classification. Everything else that comes out of this classification, you know, in some sense is realized in nature. So um, what are all those possible um, little groups? So let me just write a little table, and it will be physically very plausible to you. So um, we write the reference momentum, we write what actually is the little group, and we give the representation a name. So, uh, good. So we have um, the case where p squared is time-like, so it's minus m squared. Then we can choose the uh, sorry, we can choose the reference momentum to be purely in the time direction. And if we choose n to be positive, we can have either plus or minus m there. The little group, now I'm going to cheat. The little group is basically everything that acts on this. And so that's SO3. Well, it's good. In this case, that's actually correct. In the general case, you cannot really guess what the little group is just from such a naive argument. But the representation is, this, is that of a massive particle. So this is massive. Second case is p squared is null. Now you can have one convenient choice is where, um, well, obviously you have to have a null vector here. And you can align the spatial components purely in the three direction. Now the little group is actually not you might have said that now it's SO2, but it's not. It's actually ISO2, which is a different object, basically the symmetry of affine two-dimensional space. This is massless. Okay? And we will spend most of our time exploring these kinds of representations. Um, of course, you know, like next lecture, we will then write, start writing dynamical principles and we'll go, you know, much further than all this group theory. But we will mostly, for the first part of the course, really talk about these objects. Um, so this is, uh, okay, so this is the space-like case and here you can, for example, align it along the um, three axis. And here the little group is again what you might have naively guessed, SO1, 2. This is a tachyon, a tachyonic representation. And then the last one that is worth distinguishing is where P squared, well, P itself is actually zero. Mm. And so the reference momentum is literally zero, 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 zero mu. You have the full SO1, 3. Um, well, Again, for our purposes, we usually take the proper orthochronous part, and then actually this also becomes the proper orthochronous part. Um, and this is the vacuum, okay? This is just nothingness, no excitation, okay? So this makes perfect sense. It's just a light cone. What can you have? You can be at the origin. You can be at the space-like distance. You can be on the light cone, and you can be on a time-like distance. And... Okay, so um, what we will do is next time we will look at um, precisely how do you characterize the little group and its algebra, how do the generators act on states, okay? That's a, that's a relatively simple thing to do. 
given what we've already done. And we will find, for example, particularly this case we look at, that there is more than just the SO2 part. Um, and uh, then we will really zoom in on the massless representation. So I will briefly go through the massive case because it's the simplest as an example, but we will really zoom in on the massless representations. And we'll be very quickly able to start talking about the particular massless representation, which is the graviton. All right, any questions? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, the, this cannot be proved. I mean, do, well, how do we know what possible, uh, you know, physical phenomena might exist in the universe? But so far, the ones that we have seen, this statement is correct. But I'm just, I'm just, I'm objecting even to the notion that this can be proved mathematically. I mean, how are you going to prove mathematically that this or that particle exists? We don't go through this elaborate process of construct, you know, for constructing a there, unitary ellipse there. Why did I really have to go through this elaborate process? Do you mean uh, if you just want to have like a, a general spinorial representation of the, of yes. the? So when, when I consider the ellipse of SU two, I don't go through such a process. Well, I mean, I'm sure there is a. Well, I'm not sure actually. I sub suspect that there is a, a way of of doing what I'm going to do just by using this approach to the representation theory. But the advantage of this is it will tell us also how do the unitary irreps act on the states. And this action will be important later to, you know, when we get to constraints from like low energy theorems, for example, or when we, when we start studying things like the Weinberg-Witten theorem and so on. So to my knowledge, this is useful for what we're going to do next, but maybe there is an approach where you just look at the general, I know what you mean, like you look at the covering group and then you have you know, two SU2s and so on and so forth. That's what you want to say, right? Uh, more like I could have done with like there, I could have taken a reference, uh, say, uh, particle which is align aligned around Z direction and then try to construct the entire uh, uh, representation, different representations of particles aligned around Z direction, something like that. and. Well, to be honest, I'm not quite sure what you're saying is so different from what we're doing, but maybe we'll postpone that discussion. Okay, so I'll see you next week. <laughs>